In our increasingly electrified society, that's where a resilient grid matters most. ITC Great Plains is ensuring the greater grid can meet our energy needs now and long into the future. Learn more at itc-holdings.com. Good evening and welcome to the Kansas Legislature. We are live right here in Bunker Hill, Smoky Hills Public Television. I'm your host this evening for the Kansas Legislature, Becky Kaiser. Just to let you know, we want to give a big shout out and thank you to our sponsor for this season. This is our last show of the legislative session for this year. Our sponsor, ITC Great Plains, we appreciate their involvement. And also we want to say thank you to Fort Hayes State University's Docking Institute of Public Affairs for also helping out. I'm a policy fellow at the Docking Institute. I also work for Eagle Communications and Hayes in the news department with the radio stations, Eagle Radio and also Hayes Post. We are coming to you live. We hope you have some questions or comments for our legislators this evening. Again, that toll-free number, as always, to give us a call, 1-800-337-4788. Let's find out who we're visiting with this evening. We want to welcome back to us Representative Susan Concannon, who is a Republican from the 107th District in Beloit and also joining us this evening is Representative Troy Waymaster from Bunker Hill and the 110th District. So thank you both so much for being here. We appreciate what you've done throughout the session and kind of giving us a a, a kind of a wrap up, I guess we'll say this evening. But Troy, I wanted to start this evening because we had some developing news uh, this afternoon out of Topeka. The uh, governor, Governor Laura Kelly, of course, a Democrat, she did wind up vetoing three issues or portions of issues, I guess we could say this evening or late this afternoon. Tell us right. what has happened. So the three bills that were vetoed by the governor today or this afternoon were probably not too surprising <clears throat> from the legislature. Uh, the first was uh, the MCOs, uh, the, the managed care organizations that handle all the, the Medicaid um, uh, transcriptions for the, the state, uh, their contracts are set to end. And so there were some developments in this legislative session to try to extend that so Governor Kelly can't extend those contracts. It would actually fall to after the gubernatorial election. Um, actually, we had this debate, and uh, it was actually attached to the budget back in March. Um, and then when we went to conference with the Senate, we had it removed, and then it was put into another bill, uh, which ultimately the governor um, did end up vetoing. Um, like I said, probably not too surprising um, that she vetoed that. Uh, the other uh, item that she vetoed was uh, a limitation on local governments in regards to if there is a, another pandemic, not specifically to COVID-19, uh, but any type of infectious disease, um, it would limit local governments on what they could do as far as mask mandates or other mandates, limiting business. Um, also, it would limit the governor's power in regards to uh, whether you're able to attend church, whether you're able to um, have your business open. So again, that one was probably not too surprising that uh, she was going to veto that one. And the last one that she um, vetoed that we kind of were talking about before uh, was in regards to um, elections. And uh, basically it would be uh, if you wanted to contract with a third party in regards to uh, elections, it had to be approved by either the legislature or what's called the Legislative Coordinating Council, which is the LCC, which is made up of the leadership of the House and the Senate. Um, so like I said, it, it's not too terribly surprising that uh, those uh, three bills were vetoed. I think the, the vote margin for all three of those votes uh, on those particular bills um, are not veto proof. Mm. Um, so I would be surprised if, when we go back on May 23rd, um, I would be surprised if we actually try to do a veto override on those three bills. Well, Susan, you were telling me before the show started that you will be going back for a specific reason and there may be opportunities to look at some bills again. Why is the legislature having to go back to Topeka in a couple of weeks? Well, we um, are scheduled to go back the 23rd, which is a week from Monday. Um, we don't know how long we'll be there, or but we do know 
that the issue that, that we need to address is the congressional map that um, is in the courts right now. So once the uh, court system, once the decision is made uh, um, as to a timeline for what we need, then we'll know how long we'll be there when we go back on the 23rd. And there is kind of a, a, a timeline or a time element to this because is it the deadline to file for office is June 10th and we've got to do, or you think we have to it's do something extended. for them. Yeah, it was June 1st and then, I, oh, okay. and then it, was, it was extended to June 10th. To June 10th, okay. Because we're having issues with the maps. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> with the maps. Just the um, state offices, that the, the um, local offices, that, um, that their filing deadline is still June 1st and the ah. statewide offices are still June 1st, but those of us who are dependent upon the maps are extended till June 10th. Remind us why this was vetoed, or what the concerns are about that it, uh, this was done by a judge in Wyandotte County, I believe, yeah. mm -hmm. feeling like it was not fair to some people uh, in the northeastern part of the state. Well, the, um, with redistricting, the, the map that we passed added um, Lawrence into the big first and there were well, there was a lot of grumbling about that and we discussed that the last time I was here that it, you know it wasn't ideal but um, it the number of people that are in Lawrence we would have to add several counties to the big first to make up for that number that that, La that Lawrence adds that Douglas County adds so um, that, that's one issue. And then the other issue is that the Kansas City metropolitan area is too large for one congressman or woman. And um, so it needs to be divided somewhere. Oh, and part of that district needs to go into um, the second, probably the, yeah, the second district. And so the, kind of the Republican view of that was to keep Johnson County intact and um, divide Wyandotte County in that northern section of Wyandotte County would go into the second. The Democrats came back with um, the, just the opposite. They wanted Johnson County divided and the southern part of Johnson County to go into the second, if, if that all makes sense. I'm picturing a map, and so I hope I've explained that well enough. But um, that's where the disagreement was uh, that, that, that uh, there were too many of the, in that part of Wyandotte County that was minority that was being moved into the second district. And again, you know, just to reiterate, this is based on population. I mean, yeah. and there, you know, the state is somewhat, I mean, we're told what to do by the federal laws and it has to equal out or be equivalent anyway. Um, and we're gonna hear something from, I believe it's the state Supreme Court. They'll talk about starting on Monday, Troy? Correct, uh, oral arguments start on May 16th, which is Monday. Um, so there's a question of whether or not there will actually be an opinion by the Supreme Court by the time we go back on May 23rd, mm. or if that's going to be delayed another week, or we, we just have to see exactly how fast um, and physically the uh, Supreme Court acts and makes an opinion on what the district court made in Wyandotte County, which they said was unconstitutional uh, on a basis of racial and, and minority needs. Um, but again, I mean, we're talking about the, the map that we did pass had a zero variance. I mean, all four congressional districts mm -hmm. were completely even. Um, so there was no disparity in, in far as population numbers, uh, which is one of the most critical things that we have to meet in regards to a congressional district. Um, and that map had it. Um, there's some question on whether or not Lawrence should have been included in the, in the big first, but uh, people who have shown some angst in regards to that, I said, well, you know, for 10 years, Kansas State University and the University of Kansas have pledged that they wanted to be in the same congressional district, and in this map, they were. Um, but I think they wanted to be in a different congressional district. Um, but we'll see what happens, or like I said, oral arguments start on May 16th, this coming Monday. Is, are there any problems, uh, I guess I'm asking about expenses to taxpayers, if the legislature has to come back and stay for a while, this is not unprecedented that you're going no. to go back for a veto session. And well, there's obviously the, the daily pay um, for the legislature. But uh, we still haven't reached our 90 days no, yet. No, we haven't so. reached our 90 oh, days. Oh, okay. So we, we still, what, we have we're still within the 90 days. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are you at? Do you know? I don't remember what the day number is. No, we're uh, in the 80s, but... Yeah. Okay. So there's still there's some wiggle room there anyway. 
Yeah. Yeah. Usually, when the media would always focus on how much it was costing the state, was when we were beyond those ninety we could go days. Go past ninety. And how much it was costing not only for legislators but legislative staff, our revisor's office, the research office. Um, I mean, it, it ends up being quite a bit per day that we're there. Yeah. Well, hopefully, you'll get in and get out. Yeah. And and. Um, Speaking of redistricting, you know, that, that's the only map that ended up in court. So uh, we have new districts now that we're going to be looking at. Um, all, all of the house does, and um, they, mine looks a little bit different. I think yours does too. Mine looks a, a lot different, actually. Well, tell us how yours is different, Troy. Uh, so the 109th district that I'm, I'm currently representing has basically seven counties. So I have the entire counties of Smith, Osborne, and Russell, and then portions of Jewell, Lincoln, Barton, and Rush. So when we were in talks of how we wanted to have our new maps look, um, basically it was, it was off population. I mean, I was off by 2,700. Um, there were districts in Johnson County that were over by thousands. Um, so obviously it came down to we were gonna lose two districts in Western Kansas, and they're moving east. Um, so the final map that passed, um, which there will be org or arguments on that map as well on, on May 16th, but I don't think the Supreme Court's going to do anything in regards to the uh, State House or the Senate maps. My new district is five entire counties. So I have Smith, Osborne, and Russell County, and then I have the entire county of Lincoln, which I used to share with Susan. She had the eastern half, and then I am picking up the county of Ellsworth. So you will have more miles to travel? Actually, probably not. Oh, really? Uh, really, I, I think it's gonna be more condensed um, geographically, um, so it won't be that much to travel. Um, but it's just I pick up five entire counties instead of having partials to try to make the, the population numbers work. And Susan, how about the changes in, for you then? So I, my current map, I have three and a half counties, all of Mitchell, Cloud, Ottawa, and, and the other half of Lincoln. So they took um, half of Lincoln and, and gave it to Troy, and then I'm losing half of Cloud County because they needed me to pick up some numbers in Saline County. Saline County's grown enough that they, um, that the two representatives there that was too, the, the population was too much for just those two. So they needed somebody to come in there and pick up some of those numbers. So I have, um, now I, I still have half of Cloud, all of Mitchell, all of Ottawa, and then I go down to the west uh, side of Saline County and then into the city of Salina. Um, to, I have 6,000 people in Saline County, both in the city and, and in the county. Um, which is kind of an interesting mix. I will have you know, some rural and, if you want to call Salina urban, <laughs> it, uh, but it's, it's a, lot, lot more, a lot bigger city than right. I have had in the past. But I'm originally from there, ah. so I'm very excited about that, getting back into my roots. Um, yes. my, my new district has the church that I grew up in, um, my junior high, which is now a nursing home. Uh, but. Um, uh, my my best friend's house that I went at, after school every day. So uh, just a, a lot of interest. Uh, it, it, it'll it be something new. Yes. And that's always exciting. That, that'll be fun for you. Absolutely. Did, so do will you have more miles to travel then? Oh, yeah. So it will make a difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it's, it's an hour drive for me to get to Salina. Yeah. So every trip down there will be two hours just in travel. Yeah. That's one thing. I, I don't know if people who live in... And yes, I would, you know, I would call Salina urban. I, you know, it depends what you're talking about, but anything west of Salina is, is small, and the, there is some distance out here, and I think people don't realize that until they travel it or they are living in it, and it is different. And that's why I'm, I'm always so grateful to legislators for stepping up and putting in that windshield time. But now that we have our Zoom and all that, I guess we can do a few things that way. Would that be more helpful? It's, it's been helpful, but I, I prefer in-person uh, meetings. Um, we've tried, you know, during the, the pandemic, we tried Zoom, town halls, um, and it just, it, it wasn't the same. I mean, you still had the outreach to your constituents, but you didn't have that personal touch. And, and so I'm, this year, I think was the, the first time that we actually scheduled in-person town halls again, and I thoroughly enjoyed that a lot more than Zoom. 
Yeah. I think people do. Yeah. You know, the, and we, we equipped the Capitol now with um, all the committee rooms now have the WebEx system. And so it's, we would much rather that the conferees come and appear in person, but now we're able to have um, mm -hmm. people testify from you know, another state, and uh, that's been nice. Uh, it, it's changed the way we do things. Well, again, we want to remind you that if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to make to our legislators this evening, again, the number to call toll-free, 1-800-337-4788. thought we would talk about some of the uh, bills that did get passed and get signed by the governor. Susan, one that probably uh, has been very popular that, that people have paid a lot of attention to is the tax on our groceries, the food sales tax. And in fact, uh, the governor, I think it was just a little bit earlier this week where she she did sign that, and it's not whack it off now, but it will be the gradual decline to zero at some point. Yeah, and that's what we, we thought that was the <coughs> safest way to do things um, rather than just all of a sudden because we think we have some surplus that we would uh, knock our knees out from under us. But um, yeah, we're, we are ratcheting it down. To, and, and also not completely to zero because the local government will still have their opportunity to tax food. Right, yes. good point. We need to make sure people should not expect zero, zero, zero across the board. Those local taxes Yeah, the locals can here. make that decision. Then. Okay. Um, I believe we have uh, Nick on the phone now from Victoria. Nick, you have a question or a comment from the legislators this evening? Yes, uh, my question is regarding a bill that was earlier this session that had to do with how the legislators um, agree to be a member of CAPERS or not. And basically they were supposed to choose when they become a member and they wanted to change it to where you could change that choice uh, anytime during your service. And I guess I was wondering if the legislators could explain that a little bit more and explain what their position on that bill was. Sorry. Well, thank you, Nick. And um, and actually, that was a an amendment, I guess you could call it, that was added in General Government Budget uh, Committee. And when they made their recommendations um, in regards to the budget for CAPERS, um, which does not include the annual allocation to CAPERS, it's just the actual um, uh, working of, of the CAPERS. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, so this was added to allow a, a legislator because right now the way capers is set up is that the only time that a legislator can enter into the capers pension system is the the first time that they're elected they can it's not like um, other pensions where you could probably do it a few years down the road or another employees may have the opportunity to do that a few years down the road uh, legislators are different you have to do it the first time you're elected and then you're never allowed to do it again hmm. Um, so this was an amendment that was added into the CAPERS budget. Um, I, I wouldn't say we necessarily had in a position because I'm, I'm the chairman of appropriations. Susan is a member of the appropriations committee. We heard uh, the discussion on that, that particular amendment um, and passed the CAPERS budget into it, where it, in, it folded into the overall state budget, the mega budget that we passed um, at the end of March. Uh, but obviously, uh, there were some issues with that. Um, we found out later that you can't change the parameters as far as the entrance into the pension system because there are IRS um, ah. implications. Um, and so that was a particular reason why the governor line item vetoed that particular item out of the mega budget that was passed in March. Uh, we also had uh, information about the CAPERS funding again signed a bill signed by uh, the governor susan that it finally got some money and it, i guess pretty big infusion actually and yeah. it had been the fund had not been had been cut back quite a bit over the years yeah i i don't remember how low uh we uh, got at one point with funding it but it was it was around 50 percent oh, 57 57 hmm. percent wow. which yeah. is pretty low yes. um, and and we weren't uh, we it wasn't looking very good for us at that point um, and we have we had some surplus money this year that we had the opportunity to make some decisions what to do with it and one of the things we wanted to do was uh, strengthen the capers 
program, and and so uh, we put one one point two billion. Is Almost, that correct? Yeah, yeah. with a B. Yeah. Billion yeah. with a billion. B. That's a lot of money. Uh, yep, yeah. yeah. and uh, yeah, w that's very important to us to have a, a healthy capers. So yep, we had that opportunity, and the governor supported that. So uh, you know what Susan's talking about is when we were at fifty seven percent. That's when we weren't making our annual contributions into capers. We were deferring payments. Um, and so in the last few years, we've been trying to catch up and, and try to make that more solvent because when we were at that 57%, the only other state that was worse than Kansas was Illinois. And we know how their pension system is right now. <laughs> I, I always and, said, thank goodness for Illinois. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we always said that, like, thank God Illinois is, is the last place. Yeah. Um, so in the last few years, we made strides in trying to uh, work towards that unfunded liability. And as Susan said, this year when we came in to the legislative session, with almost three billion dollars in ending surplus. Remind us why we have that extra money. Well, there, there's a lot of factors into that. First, when we were in, in the middle of the pandemic, we didn't know what our tax revenues were going to be. So everything was put at a lower level. Um, just trying to anticipate, you know, obviously businesses were shut down. We didn't know how that was going to impact the economy. We didn't know how the, the tax revenue structure was going to be as, as far as it, it came into the state. Um, and then, so on that level, the tax revenue estimates were very, very low. And we were exceeding them because they were so low. We, we even went back and, and lowered yeah. what we were spending uh, in the spring. As, uh, when we had an opportunity to go back, we went back and cut our budget. Yeah, and, and, and that was the other thing. And then we went back and we said, we have no idea what's going to be happening in the yeah. next few months, maybe even for the next few years. So we need to streamline our budget. And so we did pull back mm -hmm. on a lot of items um, and, and just say, you know, right now we have, one of those was pay increases for state employees. Yeah. And we're like, we need to see how this is all going to play out. So that is something that we cannot do at this point. The other thing that I would say is all the infusion of federal money that came in to the state, whether that be directly to an individual or that be directly to a local form of government or to the state, uh, we saw a, an infusion of money come into the state of Kansas. And so what that did is that that basically allowed for buying power. And so a, you know, a lot of individuals got their stimulus checks and went out mm -hmm. and bought things. And so our sales tax revenue far exceeded what we thought our estimates were going to be. And that's what cascaded into the ending balance that we had when we started this session. And so the three things that we wanted to focus on budget-wise when we came in in January was paying off debt, putting money away, and looking at one-time investments. We didn't want to follow what happened in 2009 when the state received a lot of federal money because of the financial crisis of 2008. And what happened was is they spent it all. And then we found ourselves in a recession or in a barely a balanced budget. And so we wanted to make sure that this year we did not put ourselves in that, that uh, predicament. And so that was the three things we followed, pay off debt, uh, put money away, and then uh, look at one-time investments. And so uh, when we ended with the omnibus budget bill, um, I mean, that bill alone, we paid off $360 million in federal bonds that we had with reservoirs uh, in BAF, um, uh, the University of Kansas Medical Center. So we paid those bonds off. We paid off a 42, uh, 42 million sorry, uh, do uh, dollar bond with KBI Forensic Lab. We paid that off. Um, we put uh, a total of $750 million into our rainy day fund. So if the state of Kansas... Which we go, didn't even have two years ago. Okay. Yeah, we, we had a zero balance when we, uh -huh. ended, we entered this year. Yeah. And we now have a balance of $750 million. I feel better about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> that but go ahead. Know, just to be clear, though, that none of that federal money was spent as state general fund unless it was just for one-time use. Right. Um, that, what, what he was talking about with the federal money was just that money was generating... Um, Generating the tax revenue that came tax into revenue. the state right. general fund. And, and then another thing is we would have paid off even more debt if we could have, but some of those bonds are not, we, we can't pay them off yet. They're not due, so. Well, and the other thing, you know, we looked at the callable dates on some of the bonds and we're like, okay, well, it's not advantageous for us to pay them off right now. So we looked at the ones with the soonest callable dates 
and, and looked at those. Um, the CAPERS, obviously we had a $7 billion unfunded liability, so that's why we put almost $1.2 billion to bring that unfunded liability down. By doing that, we're almost 80% funded in our pension system. Um, and so we just wanted to make sure that we did not um, spend all the money because if you look at the five-year uh, uh, profile for the state, yeah, we ended this year because the omnibus budget bill has passed with basically $1.2 billion ending balance. But you start factoring in some of the things that were added and uh, the APEX bill, which I can never remember exactly what that <laughs> acronym stands for, like a, you know, acquiring powerful expansion or something like that. And you factor all of those bills that were passed in five years, that dwindles from 1.2 billion to 300 million. Mm. So we have to be very, that's why we had to be very careful this year that we did not go out and say, oh, well, we haven't funded this, let's go ahead and do it this year, because on the outlook years, it's not as promising as the end of this fiscal year. And especially um, as we are in a, well, at least with inflation so high in the country right now, yeah, I we, know a lot of people are concerned about that. Yeah, and, we, yeah, we could be, it's time for a recession. You know, it's, it, they're, they're expecting one any time. And, and, oh, well, an, another, another piece to this is that um, the education um, Supreme Court decision from a couple of years ago, we are increasing the amount we put in education for another couple of years. So, uh, yeah, there's, there are other things that need to be added in, but it was kind of fun to be on appropriations for once. <laughs> for once? <laughs> oh, no, I, I didn't mean that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> you enjoyed it, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, some other things that uh, have passed uh, that were signed by the governor. Um, we also had, again, talking about money, um, House Bill 2239 that did cut some residential property taxes and also is helping out a little bit with uh, older Kansans, 65 and older, and then also teachers who are dipping into their own pocketbooks to buy classroom supplies. So how is this helping the average property taxpayer in Kansas? Are you familiar with that bill? That, yeah, 2239 actually started as like a two-page bill. Ah. And and we, we can talk about the nuances of how it, it yeah. massaged its way through the system. Yeah. Um, but when it was all said and done, I think it was 96 pages oh my with 29 gosh. different, it's different tax things provisions. That, yeah, get put together. And yeah, I, I'm not familiar with what we ended up finding yeah, so, result. So in, in regards to the property tax, so what the, the state can really control in regards to property taxes is the exemption for the 20 mills that goes towards the schools. Oh, yeah. And so the state had the level at 20,000. And so the first 20,000 of your, um, your residential property taxes was exempt. We raised that to 40,000 now. Mm -hmm. So there is true property tax relief that Kansans will um, be able to benefit from in regards to raising that exemption level from 20,000 to 40,000. One of the other uh, pieces of 2239 that was extremely important to a lot of people in my district was the sales tax exemption on fixing, fencing equipment. Yes, we've talked about that. We've talked about mm -hmm. that many times. And it was very frustrating because that was one bill that um, Senator Bowers and I both introduced on both chambers before the legislative session even started, mm -hmm. hoping that we would get that bill out within the first week, maybe two weeks, have it signed, and then have that sales tax and exemption relief towards those who were affected by the wildfires in December but it got stalled in the process and and probably one of the biggest reasons was because there was also this push for the sales tax exemption on food and that would be germane if we had the debate and so it was added in in this like i said this mega tax bill that we ended up passing um, and then also there is uh is it 300 dollars on teachers for supplies yes Mm -hmm. um, that was included in that. I mean, there was, there was an array of, like I said, there's 29 different tax p provisions that were in this bill. Um, so it's kind of difficult to remember all of them. But the biggest, the, the largest item of that was, uh, it was $134 million for property tax relief by raising that exemption level from 20,000 to 40,000 um, across the state of Kansas. 
We'll be looking towards that. <laughs> Again, a reminder that you can call this evening toll free and ask a question, or if you have a comment that you'd like to make to our legislators this evening, please do that toll free number 1 800 337 4788. Troy, you were just talking about the fencing, and that made me mm -hmm. think. I know that um, there was some discussion uh, when this happened, of course, the fires that were out in this area. Uh, right. Such a concern about those wildfires, and we've had them in other areas since then, but it makes me think about the tornado that just went through uh, east of Wichita uh, in a residential area, but I'm sure there's some areas outside of that affected and, and agricultural fencing that probably disappeared. So does it fall under it this would, down? Yes. Any catastrophic event that is deemed as a disaster by an executive order would qualify for the sales ex exemption on fencing equipment. So it's, it's not just limited to wildfires. It's any type of disaster that may hit uh, a fence or any type of agricultural property across the state of Kansas. Okay, good to know. Again, that toll free number 1-800-337-4788. A couple of other things. Um, I was looking at some of the uh, nuances of the of the uh, the budget and I understand that we had some money again because there was some extra there, Susan, that has gone back into juvenile justice programs. Taking a look, um, Kansas seems to have had problems over the years with uh, juveniles and talking about uh, mental health programs, especially mm -hmm. for those kids. Mm -hmm. We're kind of, I understand, put some money back in there and maybe make things a little bit different. Look more closely at it. How does this money help? Yeah. Well, you know, it, just looking back a little bit, um, we, we've ignored social services for quite a while and um, we just had to uh, a few years ago. But mm -hmm. um, we have an opportunity that, um, uh, there has there was a bill passed uh, that uh, changed the way we treat juvenile offenders, and they no longer just go to jail. They have opportunities to go at, to different programs and reform. The problem that we have is that we passed this bill that they don't go um, to to any kind of detention center, but we didn't offer the services for them to uh, to um, find to reform to find ways to reform um, and so we've been looking through um, evidence-based programs and adding those into uh, what we fund uh, both uh, with like drug and alcohol mental health and we've done a lot of reform on mental health in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So we've had a specific focus on, on juveniles and, um, and, and on mental health both. And you know, we're seeing the mental health problems all over the country, but uh, we're seeing them here in Kansas and we, we just don't have the facilities um, and services, especially in the rural area. Um, we, we passed a uh, CCBHC. You remember what that stands for? community behavioral uh, I, centers I, yeah, some centers so this is a, a huge week. change in how <laughs> we are doing mental health statewide and uh, it's it's um, being implemented um, in pieces but it started this last year and um, it's very um, exciting improvements that we're making in mental health good to hear Let's go to the phones now. We have uh, Harold is with us from Beloit. Harold, do you have a question or a comment for our legislators this evening? Yes, I, uh, I'm waiting for, uh, I have given it, so I'm waiting for Susan. I'm, I'm here, Harold. Oh, hi, Susan, it's Harold. Uh, number one, thank you for your service. Uh, I was so busy being retired this year that a legislative year passed me by. My question is, what's the possibility of Kansas opting out of the daylight savings time provision? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Harold. See you soon. <laughs> um, you know, we have discussion about that, it seems like, every year. Uh, we, you know, we have the opportunity that we can request to uh, opt out, and, but and, and we could have the same time every year, but it would be Central Standard Time. It would not be, it would not be the summer schedule, the daylight mm -hmm. savings time, where a lot of people would like it to stay the same all year round. Um, 
there is a way that you can go through that, um, that that requires a, it's a little bit more complicated that we could, but then we're different than every state around us. And so, uh, you know, the chances are pretty slim that we'll, that we would ever actually do it. The other issue with that that makes it very problematic is the Kansas City metropolitan area where you have two states ah, in true. a metropolitan area. And if you have one state that opts out or decides to change the way they do daily savings time, that would just completely uh, create chaos for the metropolitan area of Kansas City. Uh, because Missouri would have to either follow the same way, which normally they don't follow what Kansas does anyway, so I would not uh, guess that would happen. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it would just, in that particular part of the state, it would be very problematic. I think there was a little bit of traction at the national level discussion there this was, last in the US time. Senate. Uh, in the, okay, and and there were some you know p you know pros and cons, and some were for, some were against, but nobody seems to agree what it is we need to do exactly. And uh, I would probably say that they never seem to know what to agree on in <laughs> Washington. Um, so uh, yeah, there for a while there was a lot of media attention in regards to that. Uh, but I haven't heard anything after it passed the U.S. No, I, I haven't heard anything recently. Well, let's talk about some other things that have occurred. Um, I think this is probably something a lot of people will be interested in. Apparently, we can now bet on sports in Kansas. Yes. Yay. Yes. So is this a good thing, a bad thing? I mean, again, this is kind of divisive, but apparently it will bring some uh, revenue to the state. It'll bring some revenue. I mean, the expectations right now is that it'll bring about $10 million a year. So not as much as you might expect. Yeah, it's not as much as, as many had um, hoped, I think, it would, it would bring. So we finally, yes, we finally passed sports wagering uh, this year where you can um, bet on, on sports games. Um, so the governor signed that two days ago, mm -hmm. I believe, or just yesterday. It was just yesterday she mm -hmm. signed that, uh, signed into law. So it goes into effect July 1st. Um, they're guessing uh, that the first uh, NFL games that you can bet on will be somewhere around August when we'll have um, the apps available and, and uh, the casinos will be able to handle uh, the uh, sports wagering. One of the things that uh, I think was very important, especially for this area of the state, is that the casino managers, there's four of them throughout the state of Kansas, mm -hmm. can contract with um, like veteran organizations. Um, so your VFWs, your American Legions, they can contract with the casinos and then offer sports wagering in their facilities for ah. money raising, um, which I know we've seen a lot of those facilities close in our area of the state. Um, so that was, a, I think, a very important fact. Uh, it's, I think it's going to be slowed down a little bit um, <laughs> because uh, shortly after the governor signed the bill, uh, Boyd Gaming, who is the casino manager for Kansas Star, uh, South of Wichita and Mulvane, um, filed a lawsuit saying that it's a breach of contract that was signed in 2007, um, allowing for the historical racing machines to be in paramutual facilities. Um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> so it's difficult. It's your, your horse and dog <laughs> tracks. Okay. And and that was that's always been the bit of contention since the expanded gaming act passed in 2007, which, from what I have been told by those that were there at the time, is that the casinos and the owners of the racetracks agreed on the tax that was going to be put on slot machines. So your racetracks were going to have a higher tax than your casinos. Well, as time went on, they felt that that was unfair. And so they've been coming back to the legislature practically every year since we have been in the legislature mm -hmm. for 10 years, wanting to have that tax reduced. Mm. The casino managers have come back and said, no, that's a breach of contract. If you do that, then you have to pay us a penalty and we're going to sue you. And so that's why the state never moved forward with uh, reducing the tax on the slot machines. So when this bill came through, Senate Bill 84, I believe is what the bill number was, I was under the understanding there was an agreement between the casinos, the racetracks, lottery, racing and gaming commission, and everything was, I mean, everybody agreed on what the details were of the bill. That's what I thought too. And I'd have to go back in federal and state affairs when they had the committee hearing and see if there was any testimony from Boyd Gaming. Because I find it very odd that I never heard anything 
from the casino managers, all four across the state, not Hollywood, not Kansas Star, Dodge City, Boot Hill, uh, or the crossings. I never heard from any of them saying that they had any issues with the sports wagering. And then hours after it's signed, then a casino manager files a lawsuit saying it's a breach of contract for mm -hmm. having these historical horse racing machines, which they deem as being slot machines, but they're saying it, those are by skill, slot machines are by chance. They, it, but they really aren't. I mean, they really are chance, the historical racing. It's, 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 it's difficult, because I've had it explained to me a few times, but they're races that have already occurred. But you don't, get, you don't see the race, and you bet on it, you, you, and you don't know what the race is. You don't even know which race it is. So you're betting on the winner, and then they just show the very end of the race, and you see who, who but, won. But I, I still find it very odd that they're filing this lawsuit and wanting a $25 million penalty. Yeah. Wow. Hours after it was signed, yet we didn't hear a thing during the legislative session. Is I'm trying to remember what I read. This uh, this kind of gambling, this kind of betting, is fairly common across the country. A lot of we were states the 35th do it, right? state to pass it. 35th state. Okay. Do, is there any money set aside for? Uh, and like I know that uh, the casinos do, and, and if you hear. Uh, or see some advertisements about if you need help with a gambling problem, call this number. Is this part of that bill? You know, and that was set up years ago in 1987 when the Lottery Act was passed. Ah. And it was, it was altered around 1992, um, but there are four areas that the lottery money is diverted. So uh, as far as what the state receives, so the state receives up to 33% of the lottery revenues, which it's always right at 33% that we get. So last year was probably about $78 million. So the first 50 million is broken up as 80,000 of that goes towards the problem gambling fund right off the bat. And then it's um, broken up between the Economic, De De Economic Development Initiatives Fund, um, Adult Corrections, and Juvenile Corrections. That's where the first 50 million goes. And anything beyond that, so the 28 million beyond that first 50 million goes into the state general fund. And there was a lot of, there was some confusion on how that money was decided early on in the lottery when we were having the discussion on sports wagering, because there was one representative who I, I don't think he really comprehended how that was dispersed. And he was saying, all of it was supposed to go into state general fund, and that's not mm -hmm. how it was set up. Um, and so a lot of money goes into the problem gambling fund. And then actually when we passed the Expanded Gaming Act in 2007, more additional money went into the problem gambling fund. And then with this bill, 2% of the proceeds goes into the problem gambling fund. And, and that fund has a large surplus. They no. They, they spend it, but they're getting plenty of money to help folks. Let's talk about another issue out here in beef country. And I know uh, Representative Rogers has joined us several times and talked about this as, as well and feels like it was very important. We have had a bill signed requiring uh, new labels, or at least I, I shouldn't say labels, but they are new labels, but to be actually labeling f what some people call fake meat Mm -hmm. veggie burgers, uh, plant-based hot dogs, because it's not a meat product and we want to make sure people understand that when they're purchasing it. Well, somebody who's in the cow-calf industry, in the beef industry, I was very much in favor <laughs> of this bill. I uh, thought you probably would. <laughs> because, I mean, obviously, if you're going to go to the store and you want to buy uh, any type of meat, whether it be hamburger or steak or whatever the case may be, you want to make sure that it's actual beef and it needs to be labeled appropriately. And so this is just saying that if you have plant-based or um, I can't remember all the other different names that they had for um, fake meat, as you, as you put <laughs> it, um, it has to be labeled as such uh, in the grocery stores. And so that the consumer knows what they are purchasing. And, and I think it's just a fairness that you can't call something meat when it actually is not. Makes sense. It makes sense to me. Yeah. I, I, Yep. I was much. I was very much in favor of Me that too. bill. I don't. And, and just to clarify, it's not saying that that these are inferior products. It's just to uh, delineate them, and right. you know, explain vegetables versus 
meat, yeah. you know. It's basically saying that this this is meat, but it's made from another source than actual uh, livestock. Right. Just so people can make a, a better informed purchase. Let's talk about, this is uh, unfortunately, and, and I don't know how much the state can be involved in this, but there was news, and I think it was earlier this week, that Kansas had uh, the second highest in the nation drug overdoses last mm -hmm. year in 2021, and uh, a large percentage of those were due to fentanyl. It's a problem, not only in Kansas, uh, but across the country. I did read something about that the, the legislature had talked a little bit about uh, drug test kits that people might get to, to, and I guess that's been a problem is people are buying illegal drugs not realizing they are laced with fentanyl, especially that is highly potent, highly yeah. deadly. Yeah, um, we had a bill that allowed for the fentanyl strips to be distributed. Um, it kind of got caught up in a little bit of a, some political wrangling that happens in conference committees, but we did get it passed. It, it did go through, so um, lives can be saved. Um, and uh, the, yeah, the fentanyl is, is a very, very dangerous drug. So we want them to be able to recognize that. We, you, know, you don't want them to, you don't want to encourage drug use, but, um, th but we, we just want them to uh, be able to know what's in it. Um, it, you know, and we, we've, back to the, uh, the drug overdose, you know, we've, we've got an opioid problem in Kansas, but our, our biggest problem is, is still meth. And ah. um, we, we're hearing that from all areas of the state, not just any specific area um, that, that's, I, in fact, I went to um, the district court in, um, my, in my area two different days and just watched the court docket and every single case was meth every one of them. Wow. I hadn't really heard that much about, you know, we used to hear about the meth labs and having to clean those up and, and all the dangers. I didn't really realize that it was still so prevalent. Yeah. Anything the state can do to aid law enforcement? Well, we, um, the state does, uh, you know, provide programs that, um, that they, but they, they, Drug users kind of learn how to play that game, and so they can they have to fail at drug treatment like three or four times before they actually get sent to prison. So you know they know they know how to play that game, and but you know we also know that it takes three or four attempts to um, recover from from uh, drug use. So uh, we're we're doing what we can and helping you know put. Some, the mental health centers across the state, that helps too. We also have a program that has, it's, it's more to do with foster care, but it, it does have a, a little, some impact on drug use. It's called Families First, and it's the first time we've a, been able to use federal funds to, towards um, keeping family units together. And so if there is someone that it's recognized that there is a drug problem or, or even, it, but since we're talking about drugs, we'll, we'll, I'll mention the drugs, but any other type of problems too, that there's a problem with that family unit, whether it's um, that they need a car to get to work or that sort of thing. But anyway, th then the state then can step in and provide those, um, some services to help that family. And that way we've been able to see the number of kids come into foster care reduce by a thousand um, children over the last couple of years. And that, that's a lot. We were at an all-time high of uh, nearly 7,000 children in foster care in Kansas oh, gosh. at one point. And, and um, so we've, we've reduced that number significantly and hopefully that'll continue to improve. Let's talk, well, a reminder for you out there, again, if you have a question or a comment about anything for the legislators this evening, please give us a call. It is toll free, no cost, 1-800-337-4788. As we're waiting for more calls, there was another thing I wanted to uh, talk about. We were, we we're on the subject of, of younger people, if you will. This I thought was kind of, I don't know, to me, it was kind of like, yeah, this should have happened a while back. Apparently now we will be requiring Troy, uh, secondary schools to have com at least one computer science course completed by students before they leave that school. It makes a lot right. of sense to me. It makes a lot of sense, and this is actually was uh, something that was discussed with me uh, back in November by the, the chair of the Education Committee, and he's been advocating for this for many years. 
Um, and uh, the governor just signed it into law. And so um, you're going to have secondary and post-secondary ah. who are going to be, um, I don't want to say authorized, but they'll be providing computer courses um, for students. Uh, there was a funding issue, though. Uh, there was no funding in the bill. And so when we did the education funding bill, uh, the chairperson for the K-12 through Education Budget Committee had to include the funding mechanism in there, and then we had to include the funding mechanism in the omnibus budget um, in order for it to actually happen. Um, otherwise, it's an unfunded mandate, and right. they couldn't do it. Um, and so to actually have it transpire, we had to, to put some funding into it. Um, but like I said, this is something that he has been advocating for for many years. Um, and this year, it, it got passed with the funding. Um, so your secondary and your post-secondary will be having these computerized classes um, for students. Do you know how Kansas compares to other states? Are we, do most states require that? I, I really, I do not uh, know the answer to that, whether what where our rank is nationally with other states um, or how many students <clears throat> are not proficient uh, in, in computers when they go to a po post-secondary school. Um, or into the workforce, um, I, I really I can't answer that. I don't have the uh, answers to that question. I did have the opportunity earlier this week to be a supervisor at Ameritown, Kansas, in Lenora, with fifth graders from uh, Roosevelt Elementary School in Hayes. Those fifth graders know what they're doing around mm -hmm. a computer, let me tell you. And those well, of us who didn't grow up with them, you, yeah. you can that learn was, from the that fifth That was graders. my point, was <laughs> that the, uh, with, with that bill, that, I mean, I didn't argue against it, but I didn't vote for it the first time it came through because there was no funding uh -huh. with it. And when I talked to my superintendents in my area, it was being offered. So, I, anyway, we, it's, we got it through. It's, it's, I voted for it that once, once it, the funding was there. It's the way of the world, absolutely. Um, a couple of things uh, I wanted to ask you about too, regarding this, I have uh, House Bill 2138 regarding uh, elections. And again, something that I thought made sense that if somebody has not voted in quite a while, that uh, county clerks will be re required to confirm whether they're uh, actually living at the residence that is listed. Seems like that's a good thing to do. Well, I mean, there was a lot of election discussion uh, this legisla last legislative session. Um, and, and, and that would be, I mean, obviously, if somebody is registered to vote and they have not voted in quite a while, you would question whether or not they still live at the residence that they have on the voter rolls. Um, and so I think there needs to be some type of audit uh, whether or not if that person hasn't voted in the last five elections, maybe we check and make sure that they are actually where they say they're living or maybe they have moved. Um, usually your county clerks though, if there is a change of address, then they're notified because they send stuff out to uh, the registered voters. And right. so they would, they would know if there was a change of address. But I think it was just one other um, way to basically say this is our, our way of checking to make sure that this person is still saying where they're at. Um, can't force them to vote, but still follow up and, and make sure that uh, they're there. Now, I, I don't know if that was particularly in 2238, but I know there was one that was kind of problematic in regards to the, the ballot boxes, especially in our area of the state, where they had to be monitored 24 hours a day. And uh, I mean, it, it would just be very impractical in our area of the state. Um, and I, that was not in there. Uh, we, we did have pass that uh, the ballots have to have the watermark. Yes, it has to have the watermark. What's, I don't understand that. What, what is the purpose to verify, verify that it's this actually ballot. a state issued ballot? Mm -hmm. So it has a special watermark on it. So the watermark is different on each ballot? It's the same. No, it's, but you can't, I guess the. the you can't fake a big. Oh, okay. Yeah. Some so. some had questioned the ability for those to go on the internet and print a ballot off and send it in, and it would still be a legal ballot, oh. even though it was not administered by the county clerk. Um, I don't know how prolific that was throughout the state. Uh, yeah, you know, I, the secretary of state. I've I've visited with him, Scott Schwab, mm -hmm. Schwab a former uh, colleague of ours in the house, and. <clears throat> They, they had not discovered uh, a lot of uh, voter fraud in the state of Kansas. That, uh, most of it, if, if there, there was anything discovered, it was an accident. You know, so, someone thought that they 
had voted in one county and then that they could vote in another county because they owned land in both but anyway some confusion there but um, there every county goes through an audit every election cycle of one level or another uh, so like Mitchell County might have to do our federal um, election and and they will audit, audit the Secretary of State's stuff. office does this yeah yeah and and so you know when there were demands for audits and we, we already are doing that and I, I really feel like the elections in Kansas are very safe and secure so we did a few things to tweak it ask the clerks to clean up their rolls and the voter rolls and that makes sense because mm -hmm. you like if people for whatever reason don't vote for a while you know life happens I guess and and then they are able to but you don't want to take them off if they are active and if they're not or they've moved or passed away then it's good to get those cleaned up it is I mean you just you need to update your voter rolls on a periodic basis going back to Secretary Schwab I mean he said that on these audits that they've done on counties they're exact Exact. They, they, they've never been deviated from the number that was submitted to the Secretary of State's office. If they do, they go and they audit another county. Um, so there has been no deviation, and like, like Susan said, the audits are happening throughout the state. Thank you both for joining Thank us you. again. We have been with Representative Troy Waymaster and also Representative Susan Concanon joining us this evening on the Kansas Legislature right here on Smoky Hills PBS. I am your moderator, Becky Kaiser. Thank you so much for joining us this session. Good night. <music>